If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com, download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. Now on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by DataRails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actual advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go to resource for everything FPNA. I'm thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show, Ryan. Ryan Abdullah, welcome to the show. Great being here, Paul. Yeah, we're good make it just a little bit about Ryan and give him an opportunity to introduce himself. So Ryan comes to us from the Bay Area in California. He currently works as an investor for Norwest Venture Partners, investing between 40 and 250 million in SaaS companies, fintech, and various marketplaces. He went to the Wharton School of Business and studied finance, and he has spent his career working in multiple investor roles for various firms. So can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background? For sure, Paul. So I'm currently part of the uh, growth equity team here at Northwest, where I spend most of my time investing in SaaS, fintech, and marketplace type businesses. Usually, these are businesses that are post-product market fit. These are established businesses with revenue, typically anywhere between five to, at the higher end, $100 million of ARR. Uh, most of them are capital efficient. By that, I mean they're either break-even, profitable, or nearing profitability. In terms of SaaS, I'll invest in anything like vertical software and more horizontal type software as well. Uh, my main area of interest is in hard-to-adopt industries. These are industries that software has not really penetrated that much. These are industries like manufacturing and transportation. And that's why I spend most of my time looking at vertical type software solutions. Um, Before working at Norwest, I worked at uh, other growth equity firms and investment banking. And, you know, I think this role is uh, a truly great one where you're able to work with uh, entrepreneurs who are building the next great thing, getting in the trenches with them and, you know, trying to help in any way I can and recognizing, you know, that the entrepreneur themselves uh, have it much higher than we do. And, uh, you know, always trying to do whatever is best uh, for them and try to optimize for what's best for the business. That that all makes sense to me. And just so our audience is aware, you know, some of you may have noticed there was nothing about FP&A there in his background, which is a little unusual for our guests. But what we wanted to do today and what we're going to be discussing is from an investor role. What do they look for for FP&A? How do they look at it, you know, an FP&A team and what kind of data? How do you prepare for it? So a lot of those things that FP&A gets involved in when they're going out to raise a round of funds. So there'll be another number of questions around that. So we'll definitely have an FP&A angle to this, but it's kind of fun to have someone who, you know, comes to it from a completely different angle. We get a few guests like that from time to time, but we're pretty, you know, direct FP and heavy. So I'm really excited to get into this and chat with you some more. Completely. So maybe talk a little bit about just Norwest Venture Partners in general. You know, what kind of investment firm are they? You know, what areas do they cover? Just a little bit about the the company. For sure. So Norwest was founded back in 1961. So one of the oldest investment firms out there. Mm -hmm. Um, The broad thesis of Norwest is investing in businesses that are growing. (laughs) And now that (laughs) takes a lot of different flavors. Uh, I would say we're split in a few teams. Uh, The main team being the VC team that invests uh, in fast growth uh, startups. These are startups that are often growing, you know, 100, 200% year over year. Uh, They are, you know, the ones that you're familiar with, like Uber, Snapchat, you know, some enterprise software solutions like Gong. Uh, And on that uh, business, we'll invest anywhere from the really early stages, like the seed or pre-seed stage, up to the pre-IPO stage. So really supporting a business throughout its life cycle. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other team, which is the team I'm part of, is the growth equity team. And so this is investing in more mature businesses that are usually slower growers, but more capital efficient. Uh, And so that's a different type of business. Usually the TAMs are a bit smaller. So it probably would never become, you know, 
the next uh, Microsoft or the next $100 billion company, but it can and has reached to levels in the you know, several uh, single-digit billion-dollar uh, valuations and size. Onto that, there's also the healthcare team that invests in you know, pharmaceuticals and medical devices and you know, healthcare software. And we also have a team based in India and Israel. Um, so our team, you know, given our history, has done quite a few different business models. I'd say most business models that are out there. Uh, and, you know, we've uh, really enjoyed learning uh, every time we invest in a different model in a company uh, and improving our skills as investors ourselves. Um, so in terms of location, I'm based out of uh, San Francisco. We also have an office based in Palo Alto, another one in India, and another one in Israel. The team's always growing and uh, looking at new avenues for growth. Uh, these times are pretty interesting, uh, <laughs> but these are times that I think uh, we can relate to it, given that you know the firm has been around for 60 plus years and has been in all sorts of uh, up and down cycles. Sure. This isn't a new cycle for you. You've been through the 70s inflation cycle. You've been through recessions, downturns in the economy, whatever it is we're going through right now. It depends on who you ask and what day it is. It feels like a little bit, you know, with job market still staying strong, but seeing some layoffs, high inflation, high interest. It's a little bit unique. Uh, the combination of all the previous <laughs> situations put together. So, uh, you know, interesting learnings we can uh, take from past situations. N- no question. We can learn a lot from the past and we'll, we'll learn from this one as well. We'll all look back and say, okay, what would I do differently? And I'm sure there'll be a, be a few things for all of us. But I, I agree with you. It's an interesting time for you know companies that are looking to raise. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders, multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So, you know, when a company decides to go through a fund, the funding process, I know, you know, FPNA, if they have an FPNA team, you know, finance in general can obviously play a big role. But, you know, what role do you look for from FP&A if a company's, you know, if they have an FP&A department, they're looking to funding, what are you expecting from, from them? And how do you kind of look at that? I think the role of FP&A today is more important than it ever has been. Uh, just as we talked about, the market conditions have now, uh, you know, changed quite a bit. Uh, they're more uncertain. Uh, things two years ago used to move very fast. So there was very fast growing companies mm-hmm. and to that, you know, you need, you know, more accurate forecasts and the more the environment changes, the more you need to reforecast. Yep. Now, given the bit of a softening in the economy, uh, forecasts are really looked at. Maybe two years ago, there wasn't as much detail that I wanted to forecast because, you know, everything was going well. Now, uh, not only are things changing in the fact that there's layoffs happening and most of, uh, you know, your costs are in hiring. So, you know, new employees doing different things. Uh, but also there's a lot of attention given to every line item to make sure that, you know, this is actually realistic. Uh, but there's also uh, something to consider where given the fact that a lot of labor is moving in and out and their roles are now taking new meanings uh, and are giving different responsibilities, how you actually uh, account for these roles uh, financially has changed. So a developer that before just used to work on uh, R&D now also has to maintain the platform, you know, if there are fewer developers out there. And so now the uh, salary of a developer has to be split between both R&D and cost of goods sold. And so when we look at a business, we want to have an accurate uh, understanding, you know, their P&L 
And there's a recategorization now on a lot of uh, employee-based expense, which is the largest expense. Um, so more broadly, I think FP&A today uh, is no longer kind of a, a cost center, but rather a, a profit center where really the insights and analytics that the FP&A department can bring to a business helps the business grow and do better. And what I've seen from the best performing companies is that the FP&A department is growing. It's one of their you know, main uh, focus areas. It is an area that really drives the business to do better. And you know, another trend I've seen is the collaboration, uh, increased collaboration within FP&A and other departments. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of you know, previous uh, you know, companies and, and models had FP&A be more in a reporting function. Now, FP&A is expected to do a lot of the planning and uh, really connect with the various departments to get their budgets and you know help them define uh, their budget rather than just entering numbers in the spreadsheet. And so this evolution, I think, and uh, recognition of the FP&A department and its role uh, more broadly within companies, but even more importantly within fundraising, uh, has definitely shifted. And I think this is something that's very positive, uh, especially given the new uh, you know economic situation. Um, so happy to expand on how specifically FP&A plays a role within the fundraising process, but thought I would pause there and see if you had any questions. Yeah, I, I will. A uh, few things on that, and then we'll jump into that some more. I really like how you talked about how FP&A has changed. The way I used to like to refer to it is I think historically it was almost FP&R, financial planning and reporting. You did a budget. A lot of times it was a trend line. You updated it occasionally, and you put out these big, huge decks that nobody looked at. And you spent a lot of time in Excel. You know, and today it's very much viewed in many you know, organizations, especially the best organizations, is value creation. It's that business partnering. It's really about, you know, how do you deploy the next dollar most most wisely? And so I appreciate your answer there. There's one other thing I want to kind of drill do a little bit that you said. You mentioned a lot of recharacterization, you know, of labor and things like that. So how often do you see with these companies? Because I imagine, like you said, the companies you're dealing with are, you know, they've probably been around a couple of years at this point. You know, they're 10 million plus, sometimes, you know, maybe up to 100 million in revenue. And so how clean is their chart of accounts do you typically see? Do you see a lot of, if you said this is the first time they're often raising, are you still seeing a lot of issues with the bookkeeping? Is it really, you know, is it still a lot of times cash basis or accrual or what do you see there typically? How, how clean is that? I think it really depends. I think we've seen things that are great. And I think we've seen things that can use improvement. Uh, I think given the increase in the amount of software solutions that are out there today, uh, I think we're seeing an increasing uh, cleanliness of their financial data. There's a lot more BI tools, you know, analytics tools, uh, and different reporting tools, which really makes things better. But, you know, as you said, a lot of the times when uh, we will, you know, talk with a business and see if it's worth exploring a partnership, uh, the way they present their financials uh, is typically not as optimized as it could be, which is one of the areas where we can add value. Uh, Mm -hmm. But that's at differing stages per business. We have businesses that, you know, could be $25, $30 million of revenue that is run by the founder uh, and, you know, maybe his wife as a CFO. (laughs) And that was fine when it was a very small business. uh, But uh, when it grows to $30 million of revenue and you have many customers, some very large customers that are multi-million dollars of revenue, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, more important to have proper reporting uh, and uh, systems in place. And so we're able to help that. But definitely when these systems are in place from the get-go, it, it really helps the process become a lot more smooth and a lot easier. And that's just not for the fundraising process. I think even internally, if you have a very clean uh, financial system of record and software and everything ties in and everything can be queried very easily and segmented, which is... By the way, another area where we're seeing a lot of change now, uh, being able to connect your different software systems together. So connecting your financial data with your CRM data and getting an understanding of how you know, revenue is segmented by different customers, geography, customer age, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, that needs a very clean system. So keeping a clean CRM, a clean financial system, and every other type of system you can possibly imagine. Uh, so it's getting better, but uh, I think a lot of our founders are focused on running their business. And sometimes uh, the financial planning and reporting can you know, be secondary, which is completely understandable. And that's where you know, the FP&A role comes uh, in along and really help the business uh, become better. 
Yeah, that all uh, aligns with what I would have expected. It's across the board. You have some really good, you have bad. It's good to hear it's getting better and not surprising. You know, one of the things I recommend to companies is, and this came from someone I had on the podcast who's worked a lot of startups, like as soon as you can r- realistically afford to have in-house accounting and fp a do it. You know, that may vary a little bit on complexity and size, but you often have accounting debt is how he referred to it. I thought that was an interesting way to put it. You often have kind of finance debt and you don't want to let that build because it can just be like technical debt. If you wait too long to fix things, it's a real mess to clean up that chart of accounts. And it can cost you when you're trying to go out and raise when people can't make sense of your numbers. A hundred percent. And I think the cost that you all face is much greater than the cost that it would take to implement the solutions. Mm -hmm. I think the reluctance I've seen to implement the solutions is just time. And a lot of these businesses they just don't have enough time. They're trying to grow. There's so many things going around. But I do think it's worth investing in this at some point. And the earlier, the better, because it just compounds, as you said. Yeah. And that's usually how it works. It's We don't have time. It's not so much always the cost. It's the time factor. But if you don't do it, you're going to spend a lot more time in the long run. But you just don't want to sacrifice the time today. It's, it's like when you build a financial model and you know you need to rebuild it because it's a total mess. You're like, that will take two weeks and you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. I, at least I've done that a few times. I imagine you could relate to that one. A hundred percent. Completely <laughs> agreed. And, you know, then there's things like, you know, best practices and standard formatting. I think that's always appreciated. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into this. Completely agree. So, you know, when you're working with an FP&A department, you know, what, what analysis materials are you looking for, for from, you know, the FP&A department as you're going through your due diligence and having those conversations? I mean, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think in initial conversations, the data requests are a little more basic. And it's just about understanding, firstly, what the business does. Uh, and once we have an understanding of what the business does and, you know, what are the market dynamics around, you know, that business, then it makes sense to delve deeper. But, you know, Sometimes, you know, it doesn't make sense to even look at the financials if it's in a dying industry or, you know, something like that. But, you know, once we establish that it's interesting, uh, typically we'll start pretty basic and just ask, uh, you know, your income statement, your balance sheet, your cash flow statement, a cap table to see, you know, who are the main you know, owners within this business. Mm-hmm. Uh, something that we really find very important for us is having a, a document you, you can get from your QuickBooks or from your ERP on all your customers and your customer spend per month. Uh, so seeing how much each customer is spending per month, that allows us to calculate things like net retention, gross retention, to understand the health of the business. Uh, mm-hmm. And I would say that alongside with a forecast on how you think the business will do uh, in the future, uh, that is realistic, <laughs> it would be great. Uh, and that, I think, is the initial data request. Uh, after looking at that, you know, we'll probably uh, take into that and reformat it to our liking, you know, to our standard template and, you know, figure out, you know, different, uh, you know, metrics. So how does your gross margin trend over time? How does your COGS trend over time? Things like that, just to see, you know, at a high level, is this the type of business, uh, you know, that makes sense to invest in? And mm-hmm. if that all checks out positively, then we get into significantly more detail. And so that typically comes after the IOI stage, going into the LOI stage. And yep. in that, uh, you know, we'll ask a few more uh, documents. And, and one of those will be, uh, you know, you're having your sales pipeline. So understanding, uh, you know, all your customers that are potentially going to upgrade and buying a new solution from you or potential new customers and, you know, how far in the conversations are you with them and what is the estimate of the contract size they would get and how does that flow into then, uh, you know, next year's revenue and future forecasts? And we look at a metric called pipeline coverage, which says, you know, if you expect to grow by a million dollars next year, how much pipeline revenue do you have? And, yep. you know, how easy mm-hmm. it is to cover that? And then there's things like weighted pipeline, unweighted pipeline. It won't bore you with the details. Um, but so that's one type of data request we would ask. Another one would be a KPI driven model. So, mm-hmm. you know, not every business will be able to put this together but some will, and that would be greatly appreciated just to understand how you actually get to your forecasted numbers. Is it just that you say that last year you grew 20% so this year you'll grow 20% or is it a bit more detailed saying, okay, I have this many salespeople. Each salesperson can do X amount of calls. 
historically using our Salesforce, we can see that the conversion from you know first call to product demo to you know contract to customer is X and Y Z percent, and then that means given our pipeline, we should convert you know this amount of new revenue this year and next year, uh, and then going to even more details, seeing you know how does that impact revenue because revenue is when you actually deliver the product. Uh, you know, there's timings, and so you can build a kind of like rolling cohorts on when you think uh, you know they will onboard and when you'll deliver the product, and when that will translate to uh, revenue rather than you know bookings and billings. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I think another area is really having an understanding of how are you going to uh, you know first of all you know you're raising money. What type of money is is are you raising? Are you raising primary capital or secondary capital? Primary capital being money on the balance sheet of the business. Secondary capital being capital for the initial founders and shareholders that you know might want to take some chips off the table. Uh, now, secondary capital is understandable. Uh, primary capital is also understandable, but needs to be better defined. So, how much money does it actually make sense to raise? Right, because it's good to raise a hundred million dollars, but if you can't deploy a hundred million dollars, then there's no point raising a hundred million dollars. You're just diluting yourself and causing more issues uh, for the future. So, you know, I think this is a conversation that the uh, FP&A team and the management team and the strategy team has to have internally and see, you know, how much capital do we actually need to keep growing and what are our growth targets? And from that, being able to, uh, you know, have an ask. And so I think your, uh, the amount of money you raise needs to be built upon a model that the FP&A team and the, the management team you know, worked on together. Uh, it just makes more sense because if you have a bunch of cash sitting on the bank and you're not using it, it just doesn't make any sense to anyone involved. Um, another thing is slicing and dicing the data. So <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine, you know, revenue by every single, you know, factor you can segment you can think of, cost by every segment you can mm-hmm. think of. Uh, that can get pretty tedious, you know, with your index matches and your, you know, pivot tables. Maybe it, it can get pretty bad. Uh, so there's a lot of software solutions out there that help with that. Uh, that you know some of our companies use, and I think that's very useful. And, and finally, you know, I think the biggest role in FBNA, at least as it concerns you know fundraising, is actually after the fundraise, <laughs> because uh, you know now that you have the money, how are you actually going to use it, and uh, are you reporting that efficiently, uh, and what are your management and controls to make sure that this is being actually done according to plan, and what's budget and what's forecast and plan, and so. I think you'll have, you know, monthly meetings to see are you mm-hmm. hitting the plan or not. And so you really your plan that you put forward during the initial uh, you know, fundraising process uh, needs to play out to some extent, right? It's understandable if it doesn't for various reasons, but it needs to be directionally correct or at least explainable. Um, yep. I babbled a bit there, but... <laughs> no, there, there's a lot to unpack there. So a couple things I have. You know, first you'd mention, you know, you want to forecast and... You mentioned some are better than others. So I'm, I'm curious, are, you said a realistic forecast is, I think, the word you used. How often do you find the forecasts are realistic? Or do you get a lot of stuff where you, know, you could tell from day one, like, this is unachievable. First thing we're going to need to do is go back and you know really dig into this and understand how they even believe this could be you know, achieved. I think that's a good point. I think ultimately the founders uh, and CEOs of the business have a better understanding of the business than I or the rest of my team will sure. ever have. Uh, agree. So, yep. I want to start by saying that, you know. So whatever we think of the numbers, I think we come with less information than the founding team does. And sure. so I think there's a great deal of respect there that, you know, they know the business better than we do. And the value that we are able to provide is to say that, hey, you know, we've seen and worked with a lot of businesses in the past. And we're able to, you know, draw conclusions from, you know, the, these past experiences to better help you. Uh, and so, you know, when companies send us a model, I think we always take the time to try to understand it. Sure. Even if it seems very off at first. To us, mm-hmm. you know, there are situations where they played out and we were wrong. And I think yeah. it's really important to point that out. Uh, and the only way to then do this correctly is to just look at the data and say, okay, if you project to have this much growth, what are you using to back that up? And as long as you can accurately back that up, then it makes sense. Yeah. And so that could be looking at, like we said, sales pipeline. It could be looking at different data that you have. And to the extent that you can actually demonstrate that, then even if there's crazy growth, 
it makes sense. And in fact, we actually want to invest in these businesses with crazy growth. Sure. Uh, they're very efficient. It's just the question of making sure that this will actually play out and is not, you know, more of a conjecture, right? And so then if you just say that your business was growing 20% last year and you think it'll grow 20% this year, that, that's kind of hard to define and that's not very, uh, you know, backable unless you can actually justify it and prove that it can. Um, I think having a realistic and accurate model, uh, you know, is important, especially because, you know, that's one of the first actual pieces of data that we will receive from a company and sort of influences our view on the company. So, you know, if we believe that they're conservative and realistic with their numbers, I think that's good. If we see something that's not very backable and that has maybe been rushed, I think that paints sometimes a less than favorable image of the business because we think that, you know, their financials are extremely important. And if they can take a rushed approach to the financials, are they taking a rushed approach to the product as well? Are they taking a rushed approach to the customers? Are they taking a rushed approach to the rest of the business? And I understand that businesses are on a tight, tight timeline, but, you know, it's just a, you know, product <laughs> that we see. And so that's what uh, we base our judgment on. Um, so hopefully I answered the, that. Yeah, question. got it. Th- that makes sense. One, uh, you know, there are two other things real quick on that, that I'll just kind of mention that you talk about. One, you talked about, you know, coverage ratio. And I think that's a very important one to understand, you know, in your pipeline, right? That really helps you understand, okay, can they achieve their numbers? And I worked for a company where, you know, the CEO had a big focus. He wanted every business to have a three to one pipeline, right? $3 in the pipeline for every $1 that we brought in. I've seen others, you know, you weighed each stage of it. and But really understanding that is important and understanding those drivers because that, that gives confidence Correct. in the data, right? It gives confidence that can be achieved. It's like you said, okay, 20% just based off last year. Well, tell me why that's realistic. And so that's a great point of, you know, realistic and fp is going to play a huge part in just pulling data because you're going to ask questions from every angle imaginable around customers, it sounds like, around expenses, around all those things that you need to know to get comfortable that, hey, this really makes sense. We can... You know, we can invest here and get the return we need for our investors. Correct. Yeah, I think I think it goes two ways. So, you know, we actually have to report our investments back to our investors. Yep. And, so, and we need to be able to demonstrate quality as well. And so the output of our work can only be as good as the input that we get from the teams. Yep. So that's why we, you know, we want to reflect well to our investors. And that's why we mm-hmm. ask that as well, the companies, you know, reflect well to us. Um, and, you know, I think it's not just that we ask that from them. We're happy to help them. And, you know, if maybe their financials are less developed because they don't have the right infrastructure, we're happy to recommend you know, different ways that they can implement software solutions or best practices to, you know, be more up to standard. Uh, so I think it's a very uh, flexible approach that's case by case. And, and we just try to work through it because ultimately, you know, we really believe in backing good teams that, you know, have uh, a vision for the future, for their product. And, you know, the financial function, if it's not that developed, it could be worked on. Everything can be worked on. But ultimately, I think the most important is the people that we partner with. And uh, I think that's what we optimize for ultimately. That makes sense to me. I understand what you're saying there. So if a comp- let's just say a company is looking to raise in the next year. I know it's kind of a difficult climate. What advice would you give to the company and in particular to the FP&A department to help prepare them? I think it's never too early to start preparing. <laughs> so <laughs> typically how these discussions and processes go is that uh, a company might have, you know, hundreds of investors knocking at their door, you know, if they're successful for the past three years and they might not have, you know, entertained any conversations or might have just, you know, answered a few emails, maybe a few initial calls and hasn't gone, you know, much further than that. Yep. Typically at some point uh, we see that there's... Um, an event or something that causes the company to want to partner with an investment firm. That could be, you know, future plans for growth, a change in the market environment, you know, maybe even a personal situation that happens in the life of a founder or CEO or, or a team more broadly. And that makes sense where they want to bring in a partner. Uh, and when that happens, you know, it's all hands on deck. But if you don't have all the, you know, materials uh, that you could have had, and put together in the past years, you're in a huge time crunch to put all of it together. I think the fundraising process, I've seen it to be really a stress test of the business and its various departments at every level. 
And so not only is it stressing the marketing department, the sales department, and you know every department, but most you know closely the financial department that mm-hmm. the team, because you know that is when your product output is actually looked at. <laughs> so yep. if the FBA and A team has been slacking for the past three years, and now they need to go through a fundraising process, well, you need to take all the historical data, and that's when you know it will be looked at, and you know concerns will be brought uh, to the team and to the management team, and then it will filter back down to the FBA and A team, and then. They will say, we need this and this, you know, where are those documents? Why haven't they been prepared previously? And, you know, it's not because they haven't been prepared previously, they can be prepared today, but it just makes the process so much smoother if everything has been, you know, sort of taken care of beforehand. Uh, And so to that, I think, you know, make sure that all your accounts tie up together. Make sure that you're using the right software solutions, right? If you're migrating from one to another, make sure that, you know, that process tight is and under control and that, isn't taking too long because uh, I've seen it and I know how it feels to migrate. It takes a bunch of time and, you know, you end up not wanting to migrate at some point just because of the pings of migration. But you can't have your accounting system and data sitting on two different systems at one time. It just makes life so much more difficult for everyone involved. Uh, make sure you have the right reporting, you know, business intelligence tools as well. I think investing in these earlier helps the business in the long run because you're able to see trends, familiarize yourself with how these platforms work. So once you actually need to give, you know, outputs from these platforms externally to investors or to other, you know, stakeholders, you're able to generate them, you know, quickly in a correct manner. Uh, I think most importantly, uh, it's starting to build your financial model. Um, now, of course, the faster growing a business is, really the harder it is to predict where the business will be in five years. Sure. I fully understand that. But at least having a view on KPIs, like what are the main KPIs that drive this business? And these can change over time. But the important thing is having an outline of this model built and being able to use this internally and compare the outputs of this model with actuals if you actually did it before. So let's say you build this model in, you know, two years ago, you can see how closely it's tracked to real performance. Mm-hmm. And then you can make edits to the model based on, you know, deltas and understanding, you know, how can I add more nuance to this model to make it reflect the actual performance of the business moving forward. And that will ensure that, you know, once you do get to the fundraising stage, that uh, the model is more built out and it's more sound. And so it's more likely to be accurate. It also gives you an you know, opportunity to have more of a collaborative uh, budgeting process which I've seen be increasingly important and increasingly mm-hmm. valuable. Uh, you want to have every department somewhat, to some extent, be involved in the financial forecast. They might have ideas, ways of doing things, ways they think about their department and how they want to spend or sure. earn money in the future. And getting their input, I think, is very valuable. And because through doing that, you can also identify ways to improve the business. So, yeah, I think th- that's you know something that's important. And of course, as we previously mentioned, uh, plan around how much capital actually needs to be raised. And I think that model will be very valuable in doing that if started early. Yeah. So if I, you know, if I'm hearing right, there's a couple of things I would summarize this as when a company's looking to raise. You know, first you really want to know how much capital you need. Make sure you have capital efficiency and you understand why you're raising the dollars and what you're going to do with it. Make sure, you know, FPA department can play a role there. Make sure you have your data clean your historical financials as much as you can. You have the right systems in place for where you're at and where you're going to be in a couple of years, that you're scaling your system. You're not still using the stuff you were using on day one and just band-aiding it all the way along, so to speak. And then having a good model, making sure you have a good financial model and that the business is involved in the planning, that you, you're doing that as an organization and you're really thinking through those processes. So it sounds like, you know, if an organization's doing those things and they're making sure they have those things in place so they can answer the questions quickly and things are clean and in a good place, that's really the things to be doing today to kind of prepare for whenever that raise comes. Exactly. And it's never too late to do these. Uh, I think starting earlier is always better. Uh, and there's a lot of software solutions out there today that make this much more easy than it was, call it, 10 years ago. Yep. So, for example, for your CRM data, there's a lot of data enrichment tools that can, for example, can do like the geography of where a certain customer is and their size just mm-hmm. by seeing it with your you know, Salesforce. That makes things much easier. 
and, and allows you to, you know, cut the data in certain ways uh, that, you know, you wouldn't be able to if you didn't use the software solutions or manually enter the data. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, data hygiene. And I think it's really important, uh, you know, in a fundraising process to have your data be clean. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been through a process at a company where they were looking at, you know, a cell and we didn't have clean data and, you know, we get requests left and right and trying to be consistent in how you slice and dice it each time and send it to them. And it was a real challenge. So I, I can attest to that importance of, you know, clean data. It makes a big difference. And I think as well, you know, as it relates to FPNA specifically in the fundraising process, um, you know, the fundraising process is very stressful for the management team. Like, sure, mm-hmm. they're on calls, sometimes several calls a day. A lot of their time goes into this. And, you know, sometimes they're putting aside their business operations to focus on the fundraising for, yep. you know, a certain bit of time. And so the more helpful you can be and the more you can take off their plate, the better it is and the more appreciated it is. And, you know, in terms of your role and your uh, future in the organization, if you can demonstrate that you can take responsibility and ownership over different work streams, I think that goes very well with the management team and on your you know career progression. So you know, understand that the management team might be a bit irritated <laughs> because they just have so much to do. And so don't take it badly if they can have a bit of a temper sometimes because it's there's under so much pressure. Uh, it is a stressful process. Uh, and I think it's a good process because it helps the business really identify its you know areas of improvement and where it's doing well and where to invest more in. Uh, and so the more you can help in that and the more responsibility you can take and you know uh, lighten up the load from you know other people on your team, I think that would be you know a great thing to do and much appreciated. Yeah, kind of interesting to mention that. I was saw someone who was a CEO. He uh, put on LinkedIn about. Like, don't be afraid to raise in an environment like this. Sometimes pausing and doing, you know, raising, if it makes sense, makes you really start to think where you're at, what's going on in the business, why am I doing this, you know, where's our next step strategically, because there's a lot of questions you have to answer. And he was just kind of commenting about how it was, you know, it can be really beneficial if it, if it makes sense. And so I think, you know, FP&A, anything they can do to help the founder focus on those strategic things, the key things he needs to do so he can make sure he can keep the day-to-day going. Because if you let it, you know, a sell, an acquisition, a funding round, whatever, any of those big equity capital, you know, debt equity capital type changes can be all consuming, right? They can take up everything. I've seen it, you know, from both sides providing data when someone's looking at acquiring a company I was in, and then also being involved in doing some of the due diligence and analysis with Corp Dev of acquiring a company and how you know, it can be an all-consuming exercise if you let it. Agreed. It is very important. So I'm, I'm curious, as you're looking at investments, and I imagine this is going to vary a little bit by, you know, industry, obviously, but there, are there any key operational metrics you like to always see? Like, you know, within SaaS, is there a couple? Within FinTech? So some of the, the main areas you invest in, are there, you know, two or three kind of metrics that you like to really kind of hone in on and that are really important to you? And if so, what are they? For sure. So in terms of SaaS, I think one metric that every you know founder can relate to with is ARR, just how big <laughs> you know, the business is. <laughs> so you know, a lot of, of firms will have different minimums or maximums where they don't invest or invest in. Uh, and so you know, ARR is just a, a function of revenue. So it is your MRR multiplied by twelve, as long as there's twelve months in a year. <laughs> Last time I checked. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, ARR is one. Just determine size, uh, growth. You know, as you can imagine. Uh, and so that's something that's important, just knowing, you know, how fast is this business growing uh, and how fast it's projected to grow. Uh, another one is uh, profitability. And this is one that is increasingly important, uh, more broadly for capital efficiency. You know, uh, how much money are you burning a year? Are you profitable? How, what are your EBITDA margins if you are profitable? I think this is increasingly important in an environment where a lot of customers are now, you know, spending less money on software or on other solutions and have budget cuts that are not looking to invest uh, in new solutions. And so, you know, if you have a solid financial uh, situation and are profitable, you can weather that storm significantly more effectively than, you know, if you're not and you're relying on all of marketing spending to get customers and that kind of dried up. Uh, another one is uh, net retention rate. And so net retention is just a, a measure to see how uh, your customer spending has trended over time. Yep. And you know, typically what we want to see is that customers that you already have spend more every year than they did the previous year. Yep. And that is a function of uh, you know how much they like the product. If you're releasing new features, if there's some upsell involved, uh, you know, the negative is, you know, if net retention is below 100, that means that every year you're losing 
you know, revenue from yep. the existing customers. And that could be because of churn, which can be because of a company going out of business, or it could be because of a company switching to a competitor. And so when that happens, we usually request later in the process something we call churn codes, which is just an explanation of why each customer stopped being a customer. Yep. And, you know, I think that's very helpful for us to paint a picture of how well the business is and in terms of the product, because, you know, I'll be frank with you, you know, we're investors and not necessarily uh, technical people. Yep. And so sometimes we don't have a great understanding of how uh, the product actually uh, works technically and sure. how, uh, you know, users like it. It would be, you know, you'd have to be a big survey and we do that. But sometimes just looking at net retention, you can get a very, you know, summarized view of how people feel about this product. Uh, gross margin is another very important one, determining, you know, how uh, a business can turn its revenue uh, into a profit down the line. Uh, big part of that is, you know, having lower costs of goods. <laughs> and so that also helps us define whether this is more of a service-based business or whether that's more of a software-based business. We see, you know, software-based businesses starting at 70% gross margin. You know, 80% gross margins are, you know, very good software business. 90% gross margin is best in class, pretty hard to find, but uh, it's a very good measure of, uh, you know, what is the business nature of this? Um, previous amount of money raised, that gives us a good amount of, uh, you know, indication on whether, uh, you know, the business is capital efficient or not. And, you know, more granularly and later in the process, we can ask things like product usage metrics, you know, how often are people logging into your software every year or every month, every day? Is this something that people interact with all the time, only one time, like a year end? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say for HR data, that's for, you know, reviews of employee performance, that's more, you know, not every day, but, you know, when it does happen, when your review happens, it's all super high volume. But it helps us understand, you know, you know, if this is a software that people use every day, it's pretty unlikely that they will ever churn from the software because it's so crucial to their business. Yeah. Now, if people don't really use your platform that much, that is a risk. Yep, stickiness, for sure. That that makes makes sense to me and is really important in understanding those churn. I've seen all those things in different businesses. You're looking at them going, okay, either it's, this looks great or it doesn't quite, there's something going on there. And so those, all those metrics you mentioned make a lot of sense. Gross margin, hey, are they best in class? Are they more of a service business? What do these margins tell me? So now we're going to switch gears here a little bit. We're coming up toward the end of our time. Just want to ask a, you know, a couple questions that are a little more kind of personal in nature. These are ones we generally ask everybody. But the first one we, I want to ask you is, can you tell me about an accomplishment from your career that you're most proud of? So if I was interviewing you for a job, what would you tell me if I said, tell me the accomplishment you're most proud of? I think, you know, I could talk about my current role at Norwest. Uh, we've put uh, increasing uh, effort on adopting different uh, software and data solutions to make our internal, internal operations better, uh, primarily as it comes to sourcing. And by sourcing, I mean being able to find, you know, these interesting companies that we believe in and think we would want to partner with. Uh, and so we've invested a lot of resources and man hours into developing uh, more automated sourcing uh, uh, functionalities, which I think have paid their dividends over time. Uh, and I think this is an area that a lot of uh, different VC funds are now starting to uh, look into. And I'm glad that we were able to do that, you know, call it two years ago and have been doing this, you know, continuously since. Continuously looking at new data uh, providers and different platforms we can use uh, to make our sourcing efforts more efficient and better to make sure that, you know, we really know, you know what businesses out there uh, are performing well and which one should we be uh, in contact with. Uh, and so I've been you know, involved in some of these efforts, leading some of these efforts, and I'm very happy that uh, they've been going well and they've paid uh, out pretty well for us. Uh, so I think that's uh, an area that uh, you know, I encourage other venture funds to look into, but also also companies themselves you know, when it comes to uh, figuring out who would be potential customers investing in different solutions to you know, landscape the market and see which you know, companies would be best customers. Good, good answer. It makes a lot of sense to use technology to understand the landscape, to really you know take advantage of what's out there because there's a lot that can save us time, make us more efficient, you know, provide value if we implement them right. So I, I agree with you there. You know, so next one here, we like to ask a little bit of the opposite side of this. Can you try describe a time you have experienced a failure, something that didn't go right at work? You know, maybe an analysis gone wrong. You know, an investment 
that you wish you would have never made and you kind of look at as a failure. And then what did you learn from that? What was the the takeaway from that experience? Um, I think, you know, related to the previous point, uh, trying to do too many things at once (laughs) too quickly. (laughs) Uh, And I think this is something that a lot of FBA professionals are now faced with, with the increasing amount of software solutions that are out there. Uh, you know, which ones do you adopt and when do you adopt them? It'd be great to adopt everything from day one, but frankly, it doesn't make sense to do that just because um, Mm -hmm. there's a lot to do with change management. Uh, And so this is uh, something I think, uh, you know, I maybe failed in at the beginning uh, is just trying to do too much at once and changing too many things. There's a lot of people that are involved uh, across the organization that have their roles defined and trying to, you know, change these roles in a very quick manner, uh, you know, can cause some friction at times because you're changing uh, how a person works. Uh, and so I think uh, I could have placed more effort in change management and making sure that, you know, these software solutions that we adopt, there was more time for them to be adopted uh, and, you know, maybe more instructions on how they could be adopted and, you know, more tutorials. Uh, but ultimately, everything worked out for the best. But yes, I do think uh, that change management is super important, especially in our environment where everything's changing constantly, super quickly, and at an increasing rate, uh, that everyone's on board, every know, everyone knows what's happening, why we're doing this, just to get people motivated. Uh, because mm-hmm. if things are changing too quickly and people are left out of that picture, uh, I think they can uh, start just feeling that they're not involved and that reduces motivation. So yes, definitely involve everyone uh, as you're deploying uh, new solutions, be it software, new ways of doing things, have people have their say, have people really give their input. And I think, you know, what I learned from this process is, is it's much, I think the journey is even more important than the goal. <laughs> you know, you really need to enjoy what you're doing day in and day out. And then when you do enjoy what you're doing, the output just takes care of itself mm-hmm. because you're just passionate and happy to put in the extra hours or the extra work. Uh, to do this and you will always go and find new ways to make it better so yes i think uh the main takeaway is you know it's a team have everyone involved and really enjoy the process you know while you're at it so really enjoy the companies you work with really uh you know try to find ways to integrate people within you know decision making and i think that's the best way to do things Yep. Uh, you know, communicate, change management, involve the team, all really, really important. And if you don't do it, you often end up with a, a mess when it's all said and done. So totally understand that. You know, next one I have here for you, what is something unique that you can share about yourself with our audience? Something we wouldn't find online, hobby, in, you know, interesting passion, something you've done in the past, whatever it might be. So aside from investing, I'm very much into uh, photography, specifically beauty photography, which is uh, taking photos for, uh, I would say, makeup companies for ads. <laughs> so different types of, uh, you know, eyeliners or, you know, beauty products. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of detail that goes into it. And, uh, you know, I always thought growing up that uh, art was uh, more, uh, less quantitative and more qualitative. But as I, you know, studied photography more, I came to understand and learn that photography is actually a very technical, uh, you know, field. And the way you place the lights, at which angle you place them, and how many you place them, uh, it really creates the look and feel of a picture. And it's significantly more quantitative than I ever imagined. And, you know, to me, being more in the financial world, that appealed to me a lot, how art actually uh, can be very number-driven and analytics driven. Uh, and so, yeah, I do beauty photography. I really enjoy it. Uh, and it's uh, something that keeps me busy and keeps my mind off uh, investing sometimes. Well, cool. No, that's a great one. I wouldn't have guessed that. So I appreciate that answer. It's always fun to learn different things about people. We get all kinds of, you know, different answers of the hobbies of people. So it's always fun to know what people like to do outside of work. It's always good to have those hobbies. So here's our, uh, Last question before we just ask you a little bit of where people can learn more about you. And this is a question we ask everybody is, you know, our show is sponsored by Data Rails. Data Rails is an FP&A platform for, for people that want to stay in Excel. And so we always like to ask, what's your favorite Excel formula, feature, function? What's your favorite thing about Excel? I think uh, when it comes to slicing and dicing data, I think pivot tables <laughs> really come out to be very useful, uh, especially on the go. Uh, and so I'd say pivot tables and if looking for a formula, 
you know, maybe uh, transitioning from index match into XLOOKUP <laughs> that saves quite a bit of time. Uh, so yeah, those are two features I, I like about. I like uh, I like both those. I'm an XLOOKUP fan, and I love my I love a good pivot table. So, well, we'll go ahead and leave it there, and just let you uh, tell our audience if they want to follow you, learn about more about you or Norwest Ventures. How should they go about that? For sure. So. Um, you know, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Send me a connection request if it makes sense. Uh, send me any uh, messages or questions you might have after this podcast that I could, you know, expand on or have an answer. Uh, also, you know, feel free to visit the Norwest website, nvp.com, just three characters, uh, and, you know, see if any of the businesses we invested are similar to your business and, you know, could be interesting to talk to us about. And, you know, feel free to email me. My email is uh, r for y and then Abdullah, A-B-D-U-L-L-A-H, at nvp.com. You know, happy to have a chat and, you know, see if, you know, we can work together and answer any questions you might have. Great. Well, again, appreciate your time today, Ryan, talking a little bit about investment and look forward to the audience getting an opportunity to listen to you talk about how, you know, FP&A can help navigate, help the business work through that process and make sure it goes as smooth as possible. So thanks again. And we'll be chatting soon, I'm sure. Thanks, Ryan. For sure. Thank you for having me.